On the 28th of May 2013, an incident took place in a computer lab on campus at the Queensland University of Technology here in Australia. A young student, Alex Wood, and two friends, whose identities are unknown, walked into the computer lab hoping to use a computer. A university staff member, Cindy Pryor, approached the group and asked them whether or not they were Indigenous, informing them that they had entered an Indigenous space for Aboriginal and Torres Strait students and that they needed to find another computer room on campus. The students left the computer lab at her request. Later, Alex posted a comment in the Facebook group, QUT Stalker Space, saying, just got kicked out of the unsigned Indigenous computer room. QUT, stopping segregation with segregation. Among many comments was one by another student, Jackson Powell, saying, I wonder where the white supremacist computer lab is. In August 2015, over two years after the incident occurred, Alex and Jackson discovered that legal action was being taken against them for their Facebook posts. One has to wonder if they could even remember what the comments were that had gotten them in trouble. I know I can't recall interactions I had on social media in the last week, let alone over two years ago. So who was so grievously harmed by their posts to be pursuing this legally years later? None other than Cindy Pryor, the woman who had initially asked Alex and his friends to leave the computer lab due to their race. Ms Pryor claimed that the comments caused her to suffer offence, embarrassment, humiliation and psychiatric injury. Ms Pryor was not mentioned by name anywhere in the comments, but she was so psychologically damaged by the posts that she had been unable to return to work due to the trauma and was now seeking some $250,000 in lost wages, general damages and future economic loss. How is this possible? Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act of 1975 was added in 1995. This section states, Offensive behaviour because of race, colour or national or ethnic origin. It is unlawful for a person to do an act, otherwise than in private, if a. The act is reasonably likely, in all the circumstances, to offend, insult, humiliate or intimidate another person or a group of people, and b. The act is done because of the race, colour or national or ethnic origin of the other person or some or all of the people in the group. Essentially, this law makes it illegal to say something in public, including online, that could offend, insult, humiliate or intimidate another person on the basis of their race. Cindy Pryor claimed to be offended, insulted and humiliated on the basis of her race. Pryor lodged complaints against QUT itself and multiple students and staff members from QUT who had commented on the Facebook post but most of those involved chose to settle out of court to avoid the legal and media trial. Only three decided to fight, Alex Wood, Jackson Powell, and a third man, Callum Thwaites, who was wrongly accused of commenting on the status. Cindy Pryor filed her complaint in May 2014, one year after the initial incident had occurred. The individuals being targeted did not find out that any complaint had been made until 14 months later, late July 2015, over two years since the original incident, and just six days before a conference was scheduled to try to settle the matter. In October 2015, Ms Pryor took the complaint to the Federal Circuit Court. What followed was a long and expensive legal battle, which ended in November 2016 when a judge finally dismissed the case. Ms Pryor's appeal was rejected, and she was ordered to pay the men some $200,000 in costs associated with defending themselves. A happy ending, in this case, sure, but not before these young men were put through a terrible ordeal working to defend themselves and several others had already settled out of court to avoid their own ordeal. All of this for daring to criticise a university policy on Facebook. Supporters of 18C routinely point to Section 18D of the Racial Discrimination Act as the source of protection of free speech in relation to this law. Section 18D lists exemptions to 18C, including statements made in good faith, in the performance, exhibition or distribution of an artistic work, or in the course of any statement, publication, discussion or debate made or held for any genuine academic, artistic or scientific purpose or any other genuine purpose in the public interest, 
or in making or publishing a fair and accurate report of any event or matter of public interest, or in making or publishing a fair comment on any event or matter of public interest if the comment is an expression of a genuine belief held by the person making the comment. Sounds okay, right? Reporters and social commentators are safe at least. Unfortunately, no. In 2009, a popular Australian journalist, Andrew Bolt, wrote two newspaper articles discussing affluent white-skinned Australians who use Aboriginal ancestry to claim welfare and benefit from affirmative action programs. The articles were polite but made controversial statements like, This self-identification as Aboriginal strikes me as self-obsessed and driven more by politics than by any racial reality. Speaking of one prominent Aboriginal woman, he writes, Exactly how Aboriginal is she? By what superior right can she welcome me to her country? Why is she insisting on a racial difference that I cannot even detect? Doesn't her ancestry make her more an oppressor than a victim? Writing of another, she also worked as a professional Aborigine ever since leaving Harvard Law School, despite looking almost as German as her father. But which people are yours? And isn't it bizarre to demand laws to give you more rights as a white Aborigine than your own white dad? A complaint was lodged against Bolt and was upheld by the Federal Court of Australia. Justice Bromberg found that a reasonable member of the group targeted, white Aboriginals, would be reasonably likely in the circumstances to have been offended, insulted, humiliated or intimidated by what was written. He found that Section 18D did not apply in this case because Bolt's article lacked good faith. He stated, Insufficient care and diligence was taken to minimise the offence insult, humiliation, and intimidation suffered by the people likely to be affected, and insufficient care and diligence was applied to guard against the offensive conduct, reinforcing, encouraging, or emboldening racial prejudice. He also noted Bolt's derisive tone and provocative and inflammatory language. Bolt's articles were restricted and apology letters demanded. In August last year, Political cartoonist Bill Leake published this cartoon in national broadsheet The Australian. The cartoon was drawing attention to the terrible culture of alcoholism, child neglect and abuse in many remote Aboriginal communities. Australia's Race Discrimination Commissioner publicly called for people who may have been offended to come forward and lodge a complaint to the Human Rights Commission. Somebody of course did so, stating... It didn't seem fair to me that somebody with that much power and that much sway over public opinion could publish such derogatory and hurtful things like this. Multiple complaints eventuated in relation to this cartoon. Bill Leake died of a heart attack this month, on March 10th, 2017, with the controversy unceasing up to that point. Debate is currently raging in Parliament and among the public about whether or not 18C should be amended, repealed, or extended to include other groups, such as the disabled or the LGBT community. There are far too many things to say about this for just one video, so I simply want this video to draw attention to these cases to demonstrate how Section 18C has been used over the last few years. If you're interested in reading more about these cases or the law itself, I've linked to some invaluable resources in the description. I hope you'll take the time I don't think I can overstate how important this issue is in Australia right now, and in the world as a whole. I don't think I can say it better than the late Bill Leake himself, so I'm going to end by reading you some of his submission to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights into Freedom of Speech in Australia. His complete statement is also linked in the description. I am the editorial cartoonist on The Australian. As someone who has recently had personal experience of the way in which Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act can be used as a blunt instrument to silence the voices of people whose views differ from those of those I regard as the enemies of free speech, I am very grateful to the committee for the opportunity to make a submission to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights into Freedom of Speech in Australia. As a cartoonist, I run the risk of offending someone, somewhere every day. For example, a cartoon I drew in response to the Charlie Hebdo massacre in January 2015 that featured an image of Muhammad so offended the delicate sensitivities of certain terrorists fighting for Islamic State in Syria that they issued a fatwa against me, calling on fellow Mujahideen in Australia to hunt me down and kill me. As a result, I had to move house 
and start getting used to living within the constraints of extreme security measures in order to ensure the safety of not only myself, but also my family. The extraordinary consequences I've had to endure as a direct result of having drawn a cartoon published in The Australian on August 4 this year provide another graphic example. The cartoon in question was drawn in the context of a raging debate about Aboriginal issues that had been triggered by a Four Corners program about conditions inside a juvenile detention centre in the Northern Territory. My intention was to try to draw attention to the fact that the high level of parental neglect and abuse of children in many Aboriginal communities is one of the underlying reasons why the disproportionately high number of 97% of the inmates of the detention centre were Indigenous. It depicted an Aboriginal police officer presenting a wayward child to his father, saying, you'll have to sit down and talk to your son about personal responsibility, to which the father replies, yeah, righto, what's his name then? Someone, somewhere, claims to have been offended by my cartoon and submitted a complaint to the Australian Human Rights Commission. This was hardly surprising, given that, on the same day the cartoon was published, the Federal Race Discrimination Commissioner himself had urged people to lodge complaints about it with the very same organisation that employed him, via a message posted on social media. That organisation, the AHRC, then proceeded to put in train a process the intention of which was not only to punish me for having made an entirely valid contribution to an extremely important public debate, but to serve as a warning to anyone else still naive enough to believe they lived in a free society in which they have the same right to express their opinions as anyone else. While less murderous than the tactics deployed by Islamist terrorists, the actions taken by the AHRC were no less authoritarian, and they sprang from the same impulse – to use whatever means they have at their disposal to silence those with whom they disagree. Section 18C of the Racial Discrimination Act was just the ticket. It provided them with the blunt and brutal weapon they were looking for. I believe my own case clearly demonstrates why Section 18C should be repealed. Not amended. Not overhauled. Repealed. Being made to live in fear and being forced out of my home by terrorists gave me first-hand experience of what it's like to be subjected to the rules that obtain in jurisdictions where there is no freedom of speech. Coming as I do from a country that enjoys the privileges of hard-won freedoms and boasts one of the world's longest-running democracies, it's perhaps unsurprising that, at first, I found it difficult to believe it possible that I could find myself in such a predicament. That abruptly changed when I was provided with access to Islamic State websites and chat rooms that featured exhortations from Middle East-based jihadists to their Australian counterparts to kill me, clues to my whereabouts for those trying to find me, and photos that would enable them to recognise me if they did. Eighteen months later, I found it just as difficult to believe a complaint under 18C had been filed against me, and I was subject to an investigation by the Australian Human Rights Commission because a cartoon I had drawn was deemed likely to offend on the basis of race. Far from seeking to malign Indigenous people on the basis of their race, my cartoon aimed to expose the truth about the appalling levels of violence endured by Aboriginal women and children. It was nothing more and nothing less than an entirely reasonable and considered expression of a view on a subject of intense public interest, and yet, incredibly, it resulted in me not only being publicly vilified as a racist by anonymous social justice warriors on social media, but also being persecuted by an agency of the state. The parallels between the situation I found myself in after offending Islamist terrorists by drawing a cartoon featuring an image of the Prophet Muhammad and the situation I subsequently found myself in after offending someone whose views differed from my own are as obvious as they are bizarre. It should never have even been possible for someone like me to be subjected to such illiberal persecution in Australia, and if we, as Australians, are to continue to take pride in proclaiming ourselves to be citizens of a free country, I believe we will have to take steps to ensure it never happens to anyone else ever again. In my view, repealing Section 18C, a law that was so badly drafted that it was always going to open to abuse by anyone seeking it to undermine freedom of speech in this country, would be a good place to start. I firmly believe the most effective means of combating the enemies of freedom of speech is by exercising our freedom to speak and to express our views through any medium we choose, whether it be journalism, activism, comments on social media, performance art, conceptual art, satirical cartoons, 
or whatever other form of expression you can think of. Freedom of speech is the principle that enables everyone to contribute to the marketplace of ideas, where bad ideas are challenged and replaced by better ones in an ongoing process, the purpose of which is eventually to arrive at the truth. It is not only essential for the maintenance of a free and civil society, it is the thing that created our free and civil society.